Y'all ready to dive in the Word? Why don't you go ahead and turn uh, in your Bible to the book of Romans, chapter 8, Romans 8. Um, we have been in a series called Overcomer, and um, this morning I want to say my message is groaning to glory, groaning to glory. Romans 8, and go ahead and turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 there. We're going to kind of camp out in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And um, uh, God put it on my heart a while back to do a series on um, overcoming, that how to live the overcoming life as a Christian. I believe that's God's desire for each of us. is not that we're just saved and ready for, and, and going to heaven, um, but that we would live victoriously on this earth, that God has given us everything we need to live victoriously on this earth, and we've got to We've got to find those things, and it's my heart as a pastor to, to help each one of you, to teach each one of you uh, how to live overcoming lives, as I figured out with you as we go we're on this journey together. And, um, but, but groaning and suffering is, is a big part of our lives here on earth. It kind of it just goes with the package. Um, and, and this word groaning comes up some in here in Romans, in Romans chapter 8. Um, I just want to ask you this question. How many of you have found yourself groaning more than you used to? Uh, I'm not talking about complaining. I'm talking about groaning. Like, like as you do things you've always done, that now when you do those same things, you groan when you do them. Like, like little things, like getting off the couch, right? Just... <laughs> I remember a few years ago, like the first time that happened, I like got off the couch and, and apparently I groaned and Becky was like, what was that? And I was like, did I do that out loud? And she's like, absolutely. And I was like, oh, we've crossed over into the groaning, getting out of bed. Um, and, and so what the reality is that we find out that uh, the Bible says, and we'll look at this in just a minute, that outwardly um, these bodies are wasting away that we're that we're wearing out we're fighting against it I'm fighting it I'm working hard against it but uh, my knees just aren't what they used to be right they're just they're just there's things that are that are happening um, but the Bible says that one day our groaning will be turned into glory that 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 one day there's going to be a new heaven there's going to be a new earth and we're going to get new bodies. And at the rate I'm, I'm going, I'm going to need mine. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just saying. So let's look at this, Romans 8, verse 16. As, as we pick up here in um, this, this awesome chapter in the book of Romans, Romans 8, verse 16, it says, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we're God's children. Now, if, we're God's, if we are children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed... Notice these words, we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Notice that being a Christian doesn't, exist, it doesn't exempt us from suffering or hard times. In fact, it seems to be part of the package. Uh, Jesus said, if you follow me, you're going to have trouble. In this world, you will have trouble um, and, and we love the idea of sharing in his glory, but this whole idea of sharing in his sufferings is, is not at the top of our list. But what I want you to see is that you can be a child of God right in the center of God's will, being led by the Holy Spirit and still have suffering and, and, and still have all kinds of crazy things going on in your world. In fact, this morning, um, we out in the parking lot, we had someone get hit by a car. They're okay. But how many know they were right in the center of God's will? I mean, they're coming to church. Now, how does that happen? And, and, but yet, it's this, this, this world that we live in. And, and so it's, we have to learn to overcome in the midst of suffering. And I believe he gives us an answer how to do that in verse 18 again. I consider that our present sufferings aren't worth comparing to the glory that's going to be revealed in us. In other words, there's, there's a perspective that we have to have. He goes on and talks about how 
not only are we wasting away, but this earth is suffering. This earth is groaning. It's, it's like can't wait for the, the, the earth to be renewed and restored. He, look at this, verse 22. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. In fact, Jesus talked about this verse, and he said that before the coming of the Lord, that it would be like, like, like a, a woman giving birth, that the earth, in other words, the, 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 the pains of childbirth would get more intense and closer together. And I think that we're seeing that with our world, with our weather and all the things that are happening. Things are seeming to get a little more intense. He says, but not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all, who hopes for what they already have. But if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. Um, you know, as we celebrate our freedom as a nation this week, there are still some things that are longing, that are groaning to be free. That, that aren't experiencing things the way that they are fully meant to experience them. And it, it, as we just read, creation is groaning. You think about when God created the, the heavens and the earth. When he created this earth, it was perfect. He looked at it and he said, it is very good. right? It, it's, it's good. Eden, where, where, where man was placed, was paradise. I mean, it was just this beautiful paradise. And God looks at this and said, this is really good. But when sin entered... Not only did it affect us, not only did it affect people, but it affected all of creation. It, it affected the world. And how many of you can tell that it's not perfect anymore? I mean, there's, I, I don't think they had 100 degree days in Eden. I just don't think so. Before the fall. I, I, don't, I don't think they had storms and tornadoes and and they had to worry about getting in their bomb shelter or basement or whatever. I don't think they had to worry about that in Eden. But because of the fall, it, creation has also been affected. And now creation is groaning. Somehow, the Bible says that it's longing to, to be renewed, restored, back to the place that it was originally intended to be. And there is going to be a day when the Bible says that it will be paradise again, that actually heaven will come to earth again, a new heaven and a new earth, and things will be restored. But it also says here that in Romans that we who have been born again, who've, who've had a taste, uh, when it, it talks about that we have had a foretaste or kind of a deposit of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that we've got just a little bit of taste of glory. If you've experienced the Holy Spirit in your life, you're like, it's just a little taste of heaven. It's a little taste of the presence of God that should kind of whet your appetite for what's more to come. And he says that now we have experienced a little bit of this glory, but it makes us long to be fully alive, to be fully restored, and that requires a new body. And the Bible says that there's coming a day that we're going to get a new body. Right? That Jesus is going. See, what happens is when you, when you leave this life, the Bible says this. It says that when we take our last breath here, that we leave this body and immediately we're in the presence of the Lord. Now, I don't know what that looks like, but, but Paul said this. He said, it's better. It's better. It, it's, it's far better, actually, what he said. He said, I would rather depart from this body and be with Christ he said, which is far better than being here with you. He said, but it's more necessary that I stay with you. So what we know is that when we die, we're going to depart from this body, and we're going to be with Jesus. Where's Jesus? He's in heaven. We're going to be in heaven with him. But then it also talks about a day, the rapture of the church, when Christ is going to be, bring with him those who have gone on before. So my dad and those, your loved ones have already gone to heaven, have been with the Lord. It says there's coming a day. Jesus is going to come. He's going to bring them with him. And the bodies of those saints are going to come up out of the grave. And they're going to be changed from corruption to incorruption. I don't know how all that's going to work. But these new bodies are going to meet these spirits. And then we who are alive and remain, if we're here when Jesus comes, 
are going to be changed in the moment of a twinkling of an eye. And this body is going to be transformed into a body like his body. Walking through walls. Still eating. How many of you are thankful for that? I, I, I'm thankful for that there's going to be food in heaven. I, I really am. And so, but until then, we're living in a broken world that has sickness and disease. Now, how many know God heals? But if sickness and disease doesn't get you, age and death will. Last time I checked, the mortality rate is still hanging right around 100%. It's right around there. There's a couple of guys. Elijah, right? Enoch. We don't know what happened to Moses, right? But... um, but there are these, he died. We know that because God told him Moses is dead, so he died. Um, but other than a couple people, the rest of us are going to, unless Jesus comes, we're going to face death. And so he, he tells us, listen, we're going to go through suffering. We're going to go through this, but we have to keep an eternal perspective. It's important that we realize that our time on earth, maybe some of y'all are going to live to 100. Does anybody want to? And if you're healthy, maybe. If I'm healthy, but if not. Heaven's better. I just want to get that, get that in your mind. Heaven's better. And so we, we need to remember that our time on earth is short, but eternity is long. And he says, so keep your mind on the eternal. Have, when you're going through present sufferings, remember that they're present sufferings. They're temporary. Look at that verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings aren't even worth comparing To the glory. When you're going through a present suffering, keep your focus on the glory that will be. This is temporary. In fact, in another place, in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, Paul calls our troubles, our sufferings, light and momentary. They're just light sufferings. They're just momentary. Notice this, 2 Corinthians 4, 17. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on our problems, not on what we can see, what we're going through right now. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is what? Temporary, but what is unseen is eternal he says you gotta you gotta fix your eyes on what is seen or unseen what is eternal um now it's one thing for me to call suffering light and momentary because my suffering listen y'all i've I've had a pretty blessed life Uh, my suffering right now consists of a little arthritis Uh, i'm swallowing relief factor like crazy it helps a little going to have to have some new knees one day unless the Lord heals me. I get it. But compared to many of you, it's, it's, it's not much. And so for me to say our, our, our suffering is light and momentary, y'all be like, well, you don't know what I'm going through. But I'm not the one who wrote this. The one who wrote this was Paul the Apostle. And his life was marked by suffering. In fact, he, not only did he suffer, but he caused others to suffer before he was saved. He, he put Christians to death. And then when he got saved, notice this, the day he got saved. Think about the day you got saved. Oh, it was glorious. It was wonderful. I mean, the day he got saved, he saw a bright light and walked around blind for a few days. Knocked off his mount, walked around blind, didn't know if he was going to ever see again. And all of a sudden, God got his eyes off of the here and now, and he's having, he's having to focus on what he can't see, which is this God he's been persecuting and this church he's been persecuting. And the Lord begins to speak to him and sends this guy named Ananias to come to him and pray for him. And he said, and Ananias shows up, scared of him because he's been persecuting the church. And he says, the Lord sent me to pray for you, number one, that you'd be healed, that you'll receive your sight. But also, he sent me to tell you how much you're going to suffer for his name's sake. How about that? Welcome to Christianity. You're going to have a life of suffering. More than most. And then he prayed for him. His scales fell, fell something like scales fell off of his eyes. And the Lord baptized him in the Holy Spirit. He, he, he immediately gets thrown into this world of suffering and the supernatural all at the same time. Which I believe... If we're going to suffer, we may as well embrace the supernatural. Because how many know we need a little help? 
And, and so he is, he is in this place, and he, he start, he's facing persecution and suffering right off the bat. But look at this in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty two through 33. I've just kind of summarized this passage for you. You can read it later. But look at, look at what Paul faced here, um, this list of things. He said, I was in prison frequently. I was flogged severely. I was exposed to death again and again. I was beaten five times with 39 lashes. Three times he was beaten with rods, pelted with stones and left for dead, actually. Shipwrecked three times, constantly in danger, hungry, thirsty, and without food, cold and without proper clothing. How many of you would agree that that's suffering? More than most of us have experienced and yet Paul looked at all that list and he said these are light and momentary compared with the glory and see in the midst of all that many believe it was when he was uh, pelted with stones and left for dead that that he actually died and went to heaven for a moment we don't know exactly how it happened. We just know it happened because right after this, in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2, he starts talking about himself, but he's talking in the third person. He said, I know a man. Let me tell you about a man who went to heaven. Fourteen years ago, he was caught up into third heaven. So you say, what's up with that third heaven? Well, first heaven would be the sky. We walk outside, you see the clouds, you see the sun, that's first heaven. Second heaven would be the planets and the stars, those things that beyond what we can see without a telescope, all that out there. But third heaven is this another dimension where God lives, where God dwells. And there was a moment that Paul the apostle was caught up into third heaven and had a revelation of what heaven was all about. And he says, I don't know if I was in the body or out of the body. He said, only God knows that. He says, whether it was in the body or apart from the body, I don't know, but God knows. I was caught up to what? Paradise. Well, when you think about heaven, I want you to think about paradise. I've been to some places that are pretty nice, but I never could stay there long because I ran out of money. I'd always have to come home. But, but paradise is, heaven is paradise. And he said, I heard inexpressible things things that no one is permitted to tell. I saw things, I heard things. He didn't really talk about it much. But what I believe is that God knew how much he would suffer. And he gave him an extra glimpse of glory so that whenever he faced suffering here, his thought process was this is just endure it, just get through it, because on the other side, if I die, I get to go back to paradise. But if I live just a little longer, I know there's a reward waiting for me. And he lived with, his, with eternity stamped on his eyeballs. This place called paradise. <clears throat> and he, he would say, compared to everything that's going on here, nothing compares to that. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see him. Somebody needs to write a song like that. But, um, but he had a glimpse of glory. You know, the same was true with the Apostle John. The Apostle John was the last apostle living. All the rest of them were martyred. They were all killed for their faith. The, uh, um, history says that Peter was crucified upside down because he didn't want to be crucified the same way as Jesus. They were all martyred. They were all killed, persecuted for their faith, tortured for Christ. And then there was John. And, and John, history says, this isn't in your Bible, but if you look at like Fox's Book of Martyrs and history through the years, it says that John, they tried to burn him in a cauldron of oil, but he wouldn't burn. God wasn't done with him yet. He, God wanted to give him the book of Revelation. And so they took him out of the oil, exiled him to this island in Greece called Patmos. And he was alone on this rocky island deserted place and and but the bible says look in fact read this revelation 1 verse 9 i john your brother and companion in the suffering he's writing to other believers he said look i know what it is to suffer in fact i'm suffering as i write this 
I'm your companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that is ours in Jesus. I was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God. In other words, he wasn't there because he broke the law. He wasn't there because he was just doing something illegal. He was there because of the word of Jesus. He was in the center of God's will and it got him on a deserted island. And he says, but in, on that day, on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. Can you imagine? You know, we're, we're here on the Lord's day today and we're, you know, we, we're, we have the presence of God with us. But, you know, you can be alone on an island in the spirit on the Lord's day. Amen. Because even though you're by yourself, you're not alone. And, and he was in the spirit. And he says, I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, and God begins to give him the book of Revelation. How many know the greater the suffering, the greater the revelation? But notice as he was in the spirit. Keep that in your mind. It's important that when we're in suffering that we learn to stay in the spirit. Remember, Paul started in the spirit. He, Ananias laid his hands on him and said, you've got to receive the Holy Spirit. It was a little extra. And then here's John all these years later. Now he's in the spirit on the Lord's day. And then look as the revelation continues. I love this. Look at Revelation 4 verse 1. He says, after this, there's these letters to the seven churches. And then verse, uh, chapter 4 verse 1 comes in. He says, after this, I looked. And there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here. And I will show you what must take place after this. <clears throat> at once. Everybody say at once. Some of your translations say immediately. Just that quick. How long does it take to get to heaven? Immediately if the Lord calls you up. Doesn't take long. Immediately I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And John Hears this voice. He's in the spirit. He hears this voice saying, come up here. And in a moment, he gets a heavenly perspective. He sees God on his throne. He, see, he sees Jesus. He sees people worshiping. He sees the elders bowing down. That's where we get these songs that we sing, the Revelation song, and these songs like we sing, holy, 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 and all the things that are going on around the throne. We got that because in the midst of his suffering, he was caught up. He, he, he came up higher. He had this view where the Lord said, hey, 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 I'm going to bring you out of your suffering for a moment, long enough for you to have a perspective of what's going on in heaven. I want you to have an eternal view. I want you to have an eternal perspective so that when you go back down, you can tell everybody else, it's worth it. Your suffering is light and momentary, and it can't even compare with the glory that's going to be revealed. And, and my word for us today is, come on, come up here. Come on, let's hear the voice of the Lord. Come up here in the midst of your suffering, whatever you're going through. Listen, a room this size, I know stuff's going on. And every now and then, it's this, we have to have an eternal focus and say, you know what, I need to get ra raised up out of my situation and have, let's just think about heaven for a minute. Let's think about what's going on right now. That right now in the midst of your trouble and all the mess that's going on in our world and in our nation, right now in heaven, God is on the throne. Amen. Right? He's still on the throne. And he's still all powerful. And he's still mighty. And you know, nothing's too hard for him. And he's not up there scratching his head like, oh, I wasn't expecting that. He knows what's happening. He has a plan. And he's saying, come up here for a minute and get my perspective. You know, in the church I grew up in, there was a lot of talk, a lot more than today, a lot of talk and a lot of songs about heaven. We, you know, look, many of the older saints in the church I grew up in, listen, they came through World War II. They, the older ones went through the Great Depression. They knew, they had experienced loss. They knew all about pain and suffering. Um, they had a perspective on suffering that, the, that I didn't have as a little kid, still don't have to this day. But what I remember is how they handled their suffering with joy. They, our, you know, we're, we're blessed. Many of you are, are a couple generations away from that and, and way more blessed than that generation was when you look at your home and your stuff and your 
material things, but they had something we didn't have. They, they knew how to have joy in suffering. And they knew how to do more with less. And when they came to church, there was two things I remember. They loved the presence of God. They just relied and depended on the Spirit. But they sang about heaven a lot. And they sang about it like they'd been there. I mean, I've been to some churches, they sing about heaven, and it's, when we all get to heaven. I'm like, like they don't really want to go, but if I have to. Oh, the church we grew up in. Band start playing. When we all get to heaven. They start, start moving like they wanted to go. Oh, and then by the, by the time they got them just good and wide up, they went into looking for a city. Y'all know that song? Some of y'all do. Some of y'all, it was just a little too exciting for you, but <laughs> looking for a city where we'll never die. There the sainted millions never say goodbye. There we'll meet our Savior and our loved one too. Come, O oh Holy Spirit, all our hopes re. New, bum, 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 ba, da, da, da. and everybody just start. Oh my goodness! By the time they got to the second verse, the place went up in smoke. Bobby pins flying. Only a few of y'all know about that, but uh, we didn't. We didn't have kids' church back then, so that was the most exciting part of the service. Is me and my friend, we little kids. We all we're on the floor picking up bobby pins, pulling some out of the sheetrock. I mean, it's just crazy. But can I tell you, they had joy. Because they were focused on heaven. And you know, when they walked out that door, their problems hadn't changed. Their situations hadn't changed. But they had an eternal perspective that kept them till Wednesday night. And we'd do it all over again. We'd leave that church and then we'd go to my mamaw gents. And she lived in this little bitty duplex. And we'd all pile in this little, this little thing. And she'd fix fried chicken. Come on, Crisco, big old Crisco can. <laughs> Boom, just, oh my goodness. But we were getting a new body, so we didn't care. We, we just ate fried chicken. <laughs> oh, I wish I could still do that. Be Becky and I went to Cracker Barrel the other night, and I saw the picture. It was the four-piece fried chicken. It looked like my grandma's. And somebody had the bright idea of putting the calories beside it. 1,600 calories with no sides. Oh, I wanted it so bad. I mean, I was having flashbacks. I'm thinking, I'm getting a new body. I'm getting a new body one day. But I got the stupid grilled chicken salad, you know. It was awful. How many are looking, looking forward to eating fried chicken again? Come on, in heaven. I believe we're going to eat fried chicken in heaven, and the chicken won't even have to die. It's going to be amazing. I don't know how that's going to happen, but I believe it. Mashed potatoes, cornbread, chocolate cake, and ice cream. You say, is that true? I don't know. It's my message. I'm going to preach it like I want to. But it's, I know we're going to have the marriage supper of the Lamb, right? We're going to eat something that's going to be good. Well, Revelation 21 said, I saw a new heaven. I want you to get excited about this. I, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. And then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. Coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Think of how beautiful that is. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. They shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. And he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning, the end. I will give the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes. Come on, don't give up. Don't quit. Don't quit. To he who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. Can we give God praise for that? Isn't that awesome? Now, I wouldn't be a good preacher if I didn't give you verse 8. Because there's a but. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars will have their part in the lake 
which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. There is a real heaven and there is a real hell. What do I got to do to get to heaven? It's you put your faith in Jesus. Our, our responsibility is to believe and keep on believing. Don't give up. Don't lose faith. So the first thing is that when, when heaven comes or when we go through suffering, keep your eyes on eternity. Here's the second one. Learn to depend on the Holy Spirit. Romans 8 says that we're children of God and we have the deposit, the down payment. We just got a little bit. I mean, we have all of the Holy Spirit. As a person, we have him. But when it comes to the presence of God, the glory of God, we just have a foretaste of what will be. Um, and he says that we, we have this deposit of the Holy Spirit. But I want to encourage that when you're in suffering, learn to depend on the Holy Spirit. He's your helper. He's the one who was sent to help you. And he's with you all the time. That's why John on a deserted island could be in the spirit on the Lord's day. He didn't have to have a church service. He didn't have to have a worship team. He could immediately be in the spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is always with you. And he'll help you. And in fact, look at Romans 8, 26. This next verse we get to. In the same way, the spirit helps in our weakness. We don't know how we ought, sometimes we don't know how we ought to pray or what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Amen. In other words, that when you're in suffering, the Holy Spirit is sitting on ready to help you, to come to your rescue. Um, there's... These things called, in, in Florida, that are going on right now, big time, these rip currents that are happening. Those of you from the California and the beach area, you know all about rip currents. And if you're a surfer, you use rip currents to your advantage, right? And, um, but just in the last few weeks, 12 people down at the Gulf area, Panama City, Destin area, 12 people in the last few weeks have drowned because they've got caught in these rip currents. And what a rip current is, it's, it's like a little river, very narrow water that, that goes from the beach out, back out into the ocean. So if you get in that, it, it will pull you out. Um, the thing about it and what, what, what surfers know, what lifeguards know, people from there know is, look, you know, don't try to fight. What happens is they get in the rip current, they're being pulled away from the beach, and they try with all their might to try to swim and to overcome the current, and they end up running out of energy and they drown. But people that know rip currents and say, look, you know, you feel the force. Don't fight against it. Just turn to the side and just two or three strokes and you'll be out. You, you can be out of that. Just, just two or three strokes to the side and you can, you can live. It's like what, what, what Paul is saying, what John is saying is, look, when you're in the midst of your suffering and you don't know what to do and you feel like you're going under in that moment, just, just kind of step to the side and get an eternal perspective. Just, just come up here. Just... Don't try to fight it. Just come over here for a minute and get an eternal perspective. That's, that's one way to get out of it. The other one is that they say this. Just don't even do that. Just, just lean back. Keep your eyes on the beach. And just let it carry you out. It won't pull you under. Just let it carry you back. Wave your arms. And a lifeguard will come running to rescue you. And so here's the thing about suffering. The first thing is get an eternal perspective. Just get that view. But if that doesn't work and you're still going under, that's when you say, help, Holy Spirit. And that word there in, in verse 26 where it says that he intercedes for us in the Greek, I can't pronounce it, but I'm going to tell you what it means. It means that he, he literally runs to our rescue. It, it, the word there has an idea of a rescue mission. Um, Rick Renner, who is a, an expert in the Greek, he translates this verse this way. He said, The Spirit Himself falls into our difficulty with us, initiating a supernatural rescue operation to get us out of the mess we've fallen into. Come on, He doesn't just, just throw us a ring from afar. He, he gets right in there with us. He's like a lifeguard that jumps into the rip current with you, comes to, uses it to his advantage to get to you quickly, comes, rescues you, and delivers you out of the situation. Yeah. 
That's what the verse means when it says, listen, there's times when we don't know how to pray. There's times we don't know what to do. There's times when we feel like we're going under because of our suffering. And we don't know. He says, and that's, it's in those moments that you cry out to the Holy Spirit. And he will come like a lifeguard on a rescue mission to get in it with you and groan with you. Notice it said the Holy Spirit will groan. He's groaning with you to help you to, to get you out. There's so many times that I've been felt powerless when I felt perplexed and stressed and overwhelmed. And it's in those moments that I just pray, Holy Spirit, help me. You know, he'll help me to even pray. He'll help you to pray. Pray in the Spirit, whatever it takes. And there's just a peace. There's this help that comes from the Lord. Look at this, 2 Corinthians 4. Verse 7 says, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Again, we're wasting away. We're just jars of clay. But we have a power on the inside of us that is from God and not from us. So that when people see us in our suffering and see what we're going through, they say, how do you do that? It's obviously not me. I'm just a jar of clay, but I have something on the inside. And he says, we're, we're hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Come on. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. Amen. Come on, we're hard-pressed on every side. How many of you feel pressures of life all around you? Come on, you're just in a season right now where you feel pressure. Maybe it's financial pressure. Maybe it's kid pressure. Maybe it's marriage pressure or health pressure. You feel it squeezing you, but here's the promise from God's word. You have the Holy Spirit on the inside. He will not let it crush you. You, you. you may get squeezed, but you won't get crushed. So when people see you going through and pressure all around, how are you getting through this? Be sure and tell them, I got a pressure on the inside that's pushing out on the pressure on the outside. Greater is he who's in me than he who's in the world. Come on, I'm perplexed, but not in despair. Perplexed. How many of you are perplexed? You're not sure what to do. I don't know whether to go in this direction, this direction, that job, this job. I don't know whether to take this. I don't know whether to go right or whether to go left. I don't know what to do. I'm perplexed, but I'm not in despair. Why? Because I have the Holy Spirit. And he promised me that he will lead me into all truth. That the Holy Spirit, he knows the mind of God. And he will lead me right into the center of God's will. I'm just going to wait for him. Perplexed, but not in despair. I'm persecuted, but not abandoned. Well, maybe if in a time where you're just being persecuted right now. You got everything's coming against you, and, and it seems that God is silent. He may be silent, but He's not absent. Some of you need to hear that today. God may be silent, you may not be hearing Him, but He is not absent. This week we taught the kids about Babylon and, and, and how God's people for 70 years were persecuted and suffered in Babylon. And there were times when the three Hebrew children were thrown in the fiery furnace. And they were thinking, We know God can, and we believe He will. Any time now would be good, Lord. Furnace gets hotter. They throw them in the furnace. And what happened when they threw three in? That's when they saw the fourth one. I'm so glad we taught these kids that this week. Look, you may get thrown in the fire. Being a Christian doesn't exempt you from the fire. But the promise is that you will not be abandoned. Right? You may be persecuted, but you won't be abandoned. Come on. He's right there with you. It's in our weakness that we find his power. We're struck down but not destroyed. Come on, maybe sickness has struck you down or the enemy has struck you down or maybe addiction has struck you down again or maybe you're down because of your own choices or the choices of others. Whatever has struck you down, you may be down, but you are not out. It is not over. Come on, the Holy Spirit is the one who can still breathe into dry bones and dry bones can come to life. Yeah. He still takes graves and makes them into gardens and dry bones and turns them into armies. Come on, that's the Spirit of God. The same Spirit that raised Jesus' dead body from the grave is the one who's living inside of you. Amen? Come on, we're persecuted. Struck down but not destroyed. It's not over till God says it's over. My, my dad years ago saw Muhammad Ali and a reporter said, 
champ, I remember seeing you down. I saw you down. He finally stopped him. He said, you ain't never seen me down. He said, I was either up or I was getting up. <laughs> right? Come on, that's the attitude. You never saw me down. I was either up or I was getting up. Struck down, but not destroyed. Here's the last one. Becky, you can come. Live on mission in the midst of your suffering. Remember this. You're not the only one suffering. Make sure and share the hope that you have. See, you may be suffering, but you have hope. And all around you, there are people that are suffering that don't have the same hope that you have. They don't know what you know. That was the one thing about the little church I grew up in. We, we had a big time, but when we walked out those doors, we didn't tell anybody about what we were so happy about. We had it, but we didn't share it. Look at this, 2 Corinthians 4.13. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. And since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe, and therefore we speak. Come on, if you have this hope, if you have this faith, if you have this confidence, you, you have Jesus as Lord, you have him as Savior, you have him as healer. Listen, you have the hope of heaven. You have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And we believe in all that, but listen, we believe, therefore, we speak. Come on, you know that all around us, the minute you walk out these doors and wherever you go, there are, there's no shortage of suffering and hurting people who are perplexed and down and worried and that got a bad report this week. They need you to speak. Maybe you ask somebody, you're walking through Walmart, hey, how you doing? You really don't expect a response. You're just hoping they say, fine, how are you? And then they, they actually answer. Don't you love that? Well, actually... Uh, not doing so good. Oh, shoot. That wasn't what I hoped to hear. <laughs> I was really on my way out of the door. And they start actually telling you their problems. And you know what? You can say right then, hey, can I, can I pray for you? Because I believe that there's a God who heals. And you just never know. You know what? He might actually heal them. Or maybe they have a life-threatening disease. And you can say, you know what? I'm going to pray that God heals you. But whether he heals you on this side, or he may choose to heal you later, but the way he heals you later is heaven. And there's, in order to go to heaven, you got to know Jesus. Do you know Jesus? Give them, the Bible says, be ready to give them the hope that you have. Come on, let's not keep it to ourselves. Let's tell them about heaven. Come on, let's live to tell. The only thing we get to take with us is people. Let's take as many as we can. Amen.